Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our folks on the West Coast. My name is Cassandra Frederic. I am the Managing Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Campaigns at the Policy Alliance. We are so excited to uh, see the overwhelming response to our teleconference series, looking at um, COVID-19 um, and the pre-existing condition of the drug war. We are really, really excited to have so many people on joining us today. We're currently at 175 people. We have registered over 500 people for this conversation. Um, and that is no pressure to our speakers who have done this a million times. Uh, we want to thank the Justice Roundtable, um, who, which is led by Nikichi Taifa, for also being our co-sponsors on this teleconference series. We'll be doing this teleconference every two weeks. Our full schedule is now up on our website and we'll be looking um, at issues around COVID-19 at, at the intersections of the work that we do at the Drug Policy Alliance with all of our partners. Um, and so today we'll be looking at decarceration, but we will be continuing this conversation looking at reentry, health and harm reduction, treatment, informal and gig economies, safe supply and regulation, as well as drug war policing and surveillance. And so we are so excited to be opening up this discussion series um, for Drug Policy Alliance. There is a Q&A section on the bottom of your screen. Um, and so we will be asking folks to put your questions in there. We will have a question and answer portion um, towards the end of this um, conversation. My colleague, Queen Adesui, will be staffing the, queen, the, the question and answer session. Um, and so we're so excited uh, to have you all here and hope that you will continue to join this, um, this discussion series that we will be doing um, for the next couple of weeks. Um, and part of the reason we decided to do this discussion series is because as we've been navigating COVID-19, there has been essential uh, rapid response work and conversations about what COVID-19 is laying bare for us all. Um, and one of the things that we quickly realized at Drug Policy Alliance is that what we need right now is a lot more of the work that we've all been doing. And it's also, how do we have conversations outside of the silos? Because COVID-19 has shown us how interconnected harm is. Therefore, our strategies and our solutions have to be as interconnected. Um, and Drug Policy Alliance, we have been an organization working at the intersection of criminal justice, as well as public health, as well as, as, well as health equity, justice, and autonomy. And so we want to bring forward conversations that really highlight those different issues and ask the hard and messy questions. Um, some might think, why is Drug Policy Alliance starting off their teleconference discussion series on decarceration? That's not the work that they do. Um, and this conversation is basically to tell everyone that actually it is the work that we do. And it is the work that we've been doing for a very long time. And we've made mistakes. Um, in this space, um, but we're willing to move forward and to do it better. Um, and so I'm very, very excited to have our partners here um, that are willing to have this conversation with us. Um, and I will let them introduce themselves. They're all on mute because they have great Zoom etiquette. Um, but I would love for uh, Tav uh, to start us off, uh, to introduce yourself to the group. Um, just say your name, um, the organization you're with, the kind of work you do, um, and we'll move through the speakers and then we'll get right into conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Justine Moore, but everybody knows me and calls me Taz. I am the Director of Training of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And one of the main things that I do is I go to different organizations across the states and train in participatory defense. Thank you, Taz. Robert? Mute, mute, you're on mute, boo. <laughs> boo. 
my name is Robert Suarez. I am a community leader with uh, Vocal New York as well as um, a consultant with Urban Survivors Union. And most of the work I do is around people who use drugs and drug users' health. Thanks, Robert. So glad you can join us. Um, Peter? Hi, I'm Peter Wagner, the Executive Director of the Prison Policy Initiative, and we do research and advocacy about all kinds of criminal justice stuff, and we're kind of known for making uh, visuals and doing data storytelling about the criminal justice system. Thanks so much, Peter. David? I'm uh, David Menschel. Uh, I'm a criminal defense attorney and social activist, and I help to run a charitable foundation, Vital Projects Fund, uh, that gives grants to criminal justice reform organizations around the country. Rose? Hey, everyone. My name is Rose Kahn. I work at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. We're a national organization with offices throughout Texas, California, and DC. I direct our national work at the intersection of criminal and immigrant justice, really looking for ways to uh, partner with and build the capacity of folks on the front line. All right, so again, as you can see from our speakers, we're really excited to have such a great intersection of folks that are doing work on data, broader criminal justice reform, immigration, drug users' rights, um, formerly incarcerated people, advocacy, but most, uh, one of the things I really wanna highlight about what Taz said is participatory defense, um, because that is that should be one of the biggest strategies that we're putting forward as we talk about um, the decarceration of our communities as well as the decriminalization of our communities. And so before we get, before we start, we want to pretty much lay, lay out what the landscape, what are the things that we're seeing um, right now in COVID-19 and what are the things that we are anticipating and you know Peter being our data guy um, and David and Rose working on different parts of the movement um, I'll open this up for you all to talk about um, what we're seeing right now in, um, in the moment Rose <laughs> Oh, I thought we were going to talk with start with Peter, maybe. Um, but <laughs> Peter, how about you take it first, and then I'll come in with the immigration uh, angle. Sure, I can do that. Um, we're having a little technology problems. If uh, Eliza, if you can share some images, that would be awesome. If not, I will adapt. Um, the big picture is that it varies from place to place, but a lot of jails are reducing their population. The typical jail has dropped their population by about 18% since this started. Uh, the most that we know of a jail has dropped their population by more than half. Um, a couple jails have gone up, but mostly those are small jails that mostly that's rounding error and little, little things that don't matter. But most jails have dropped their populations by doing a little bit of all the things they should be doing. The police are arresting less people. Prosecutors are asking for less bail. Judges are requiring less bail. Judges are finding ways to um, sentence people to home confinement or let people go early. Um, people that are close to the end of their sentences, which almost everyone in jail who's serving a time, a sentence, is near the end of their sentence, can be let go. Sheriffs are identifying people that are medically frail, getting these people out of the system. So in general, Jails are doing a good job, not as much as they should be. Uh, the target in New York that was pushed for was to drop their jail population by 40%. Uh, New York City has done uh, less than half that. Um, so jails, pretty good, especially compared to prisons. So most people who are locked up today are locked up in state and federal prisons. And by comparison, the state prison systems have done almost nothing. The typical state has managed to reduce their population by two or three percent, mostly by refusing to take in new people who are convicted transferred from the jails, which again, to the degree that the state prisons are doing that, it means that the jails are doing even more. Um, and the kind of the, what's really interesting about this visual is that the state prison system that we know of that's dropped its population the most is Vermont 
which has reduced its population by 16%. That's less than that of the typical jail. And there's also a way that Vermont, it's really not fair to consider Vermont a state prison system because Vermont has this integrated prison and jail system. So some of that reduction in Vermont is the result of Vermont's jail system doing the things that other jails are doing, or at least I presume that's what that means. So state prisons need to be doing a lot more and they basically aren't. Um, so that's where we're at in terms of the virus response. Just to talk real briefly about the big picture and how this relates to drug reform, um, please, if you could go on to that next image, it's the whole pie. So there's 2.3 million people that are locked up in this country in a variety of different kinds of systems. Most of them are in state prisons, um, very small portion are federal prisons, despite the federal prisons getting a lot of attention. About a third of people are in local jails. Of course, there's 3,000 different jail systems, so there's like a lot of diversity within jails, but um, most of the people are in state prisons. And what we can see from this is that there's a variety of offenses that have people in prisons, which the next slide kind of pulls out in a quick hatch hacky way. About a fifth of the total people who are locked up are locked up where their large defense, can you jump to the next image, Eliza? Um, about a fifth of the people, their most significant offense is a drug charge, whether they're in state prison or they're in local jails, whether convicted or unconvicted, it's about a fifth of people. It doesn't mean that drugs are not a underlying reason why they have a property offense or that they have a violent offense or that they weren't convicted of both a property offense and a drug offense at the same time, but the way the federal government keeps these statistics, you're calculated based on what your most significant off offense is. So it's about a fifth of people are locked up for a drug offense. And historically, this has been changing. Can you jump two slides forward, Aliza? Um, most states, the portion of their prison population that is solely there for drugs has been declining. Most states look like that of New York, where it used to be a much bigger share, and it's declining. There are some exceptions, like South Dakota is one where it used to be very low. It's now actually increasing. Um, so the big picture is that it's not true that ending the war on drugs would automatically end mass incarceration. But there, the war on drugs is a key part of mass incarceration in a bunch of different ways. One is because one-fifth is a pretty big slice. And then can we go to the next image? This next image is about the number of drug possession arrests that are in that are made each year. So despite the number of people in prison is declining for drugs, the number of arrests has either continued to grow or been relatively flat as you're looking at this. So this is an opportunity by which people get arrested, come into the criminal justice system, either plead guilty and get probation, plead guilty and get time served, or get out of the system, but then have a criminal record, which then makes it easier for them to get sucked back into the system. If they're on probation, they have to comply with all those provisions or they can be incarcerated. And um, if they then commit another offense, they then have a criminal record and will get a longer sentence. So there's a bunch of ways that are kind of hard to quantify about how the war on drugs um, helps fuel the continuation of mass incarceration in a very kind of complicated way. Um, I think I, I will stop there and turn it over to Rose. Great. Um, thanks, Peter. That was really <laughs> informative. Um, so at a broad level, I, I just to step back a bit, I think what we're seeing now is a widespread interest convergence. So I had the good fortune of studying with Professor Derek Bell in law school, um, who pointed out that really white folks aren't going to take action around racial justice or around criminal justice, around any issues of justice, unless they believe that our interests will somehow be uh, improved or advanced <laughs> by investing in these justice campaigns. And I think what COVID-19 has brought into stark relief is that we are all really affected by the well-being of our neighbor. Now, some of us came to this work early on, drawn by faith or morality or whatever pulls us to be engaged in the fight for 
uh, justice, but I think that we are seeing many more people come to the table now embracing a call for decarceration because suddenly we are realizing that my very health and well being and my family's health and well being depends on the health and well being of my neighbors. Um, so we have seen really inspiring calls to action at the local, uh, state, and national level to release people from jails, prisons, from immigration detention centers. Um, and we have seen, as Peter just pointed out, the uh, power of this hyper-local organizing. But unfortunately, as someone who has been involved in the intersection of immigrant justice and criminal justice work for uh, a couple decades now, we're seeing unfortunate patterns repeat themselves where the needs of immigrants are frequently left out of these calls. You know, I think there's widespread understanding that there's a massive crisis in the immigrant detention centers, but too few people are really strategically and thoughtfully integrating demands that connect the needs of citizens and non-citizens. So for example, we're seeing, we saw a demand made of sheriffs um, to release people from local jails without any understanding of the way those releases needed to occur um, in a responsible way so that people with ice holds were not simply released and transferred immediately into ice custody and then placed in an immigration detention facility, right? Or we're seeing demands for governors to release people from state prisons without concurrent demands being made that those same governors not collaborate with ICE, right? So as a result, um, a report came out this week that was quite staggering that showed the true public health crisis that exists in the immigration detention facilities right now, where 56,000 people uh, spend the night every night, though if you expand that to cover the CBP, the Border Patrol facilities, it's 80,000. And under, under that recent study, it showed that Within 90 days, so right now 56% of all of the people in these immigration facilities have, are, uh, have tested positive for COVID-19. Within 90 days under best case scenario, 75% will be infected. Under the most pessimistic scenario, but it was run based on numbers, uh, a full 100% of all people detained will be infected. Now, that's within 90 days. These 90% of individuals detained in immigration facilities uh, are held by private prisoners, right? So rather by private prisons, it's the for-profit private prison complex. These are, the medical neglect is rampant. There are uh, oftentimes very few, if any, direct medical services that are provided in these centers. So under the protocol themselves, under the protocol of these facilities, when people are sick, they're sent out to uh, local hospitals. And the majority of these facilities are placed 100 miles from the nearest urban center. So we're talking about largely rural hospitals that are already under-resourced. So even if you were someone who believed that this wasn't your own problem, that people were locked away and they would deal with it on their own, the reality is that we will all be impacted by this. Our brothers and sisters who are caged and those of us who are at liberty of not being caged, right? So this is a real crisis and we need to think strategically and thoughtfully about the fact that these are not separate demands, that these are not separate campaigns, but all of these interests, again, to go back to the great professor Derek Bell, are converging. And there are thoughtful and strategic ways that we can be crafting our demands and our asks so that we're lifting up the needs of all impacted individuals. So that involves, if we're at the sheriff level, that involves 
when we're making demands to release people from jail, we're being very explicit that they not coordinate with ICE, that this is a time to stop business as usual, that they cannot, that when they, when we call to free them all, we mean free them all from every place right? When we're making the call to governors to release people from state prisons, we are demanding that our governors not coordinate with ICE, that they stop operating the deportation uh, rapid uh, fast track proceedings that are sometimes held within the prisons themselves, right? This is not a time for business as usual, and we need to disrupt that. But that disruption, I know, will only occur if we break out of our silos and think together on the front end by uh, about how our interests are all converging, and we bring impacted communities to the table together to craft those solutions so that what we're lifting up are really going to, is really going to pave the way for a new future. Rose, I really appreciate you elevating already the conversation that we're going to be having here, which is about like, how do we figure out, how do we make sure the things that we're asking for are actually the things that we need um, and not the things that we still think are politically expedient. And this point that you're making around getting people to understand that the conversation around decarceration um, is really a, a call that impacts everyone's health is an argument that, David, you've made quite a bit um, since the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 crisis in really pushing the conversation forward and being like, listen, it's not just the people that are inside. In fact, like they are unlikely to get it unless people are coming in, which is the staff, right? The staff is coming in and getting people sick. And then the staff is coming back out and being a part of the community and then leaving behind the disease that they brought in to the jails. Um, and then they get to go home and have sick day and people have to survive on their own inside. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that you clearly said before we had, while we were prepping for this call was that, you know, we don't want this conversation to be one that of navel gazing. Um, and that we actually want to talk about like what's happening on the inside, how can we move forward and what are the strategies that we need to put together. And you know, in your work around, in your work around prosecutors, um, they are currently in a position of great power. And so kind of want you to bring in all those elements and speak specifically to the role that prosecutors have played and what are some of the conversations and the ways that the calls that bring together the information that both Peter and Rose have put forward currently. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, I mean, you know, as Peter pointed out, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, there has been significant decarceration uh, in some places at the jail level. Uh, you know, not enough. Um, and many jails, are, the, the coronavirus has run rampant and, and people are dying. But to me, the most interesting thing going on right now in some ways is that prosecutors, at least in some localities, have worked with uh, defense attorneys and and other system actors like judges to uh, you know limit the number of people in jail again uh, you know certainly not everywhere um, but to, to, I kind of want to shift the conversation slightly to to who I think are uh, the real bad actors uh, in the current crisis and that really is governors and I, I think um, you know they're the ones that have the power to release people from prisons and, and uh, they haven't done it. I mean, there's been very, very few uh, uh, releases. Uh, and, you know, I mean, just to take a step back, you know, prisons really are the epicenter of, of this crisis. Uh, you know, prisons in, uh, uh, you know, f five of the counties in America with the highest per capita infection rate are prison counties. Uh, you know, of the largest clusters of cases, you know, cases that, that uh, come from a single facility. It's overwhelmingly prisons and jails. You know, people talk about meatpacking plants and nursing homes, and those are certainly important vectors as well. But six out of the top 10 clusters in America are prisons or jails. 13 out of the top 20 clusters are prisons or jails. 25 out of the top 50 clusters are prisons and jails. So, uh, it, you know, what is going on 
in prisons and jails is, you know, we, we like to think of it as sort of at the periphery of American life. But when it comes to coronavirus, it's the center of American life. Uh, and, you know, uh, as you said, Cassandra, the, the, the coronavirus doesn't see the categories that we create, and it doesn't care about these big walls that we build to separate ourselves, uh, you know, from prisoners. Uh, as the prisoners get infected by the staff bringing it in, it's going to spread like wild wildfire in the prisons, and then it's going to boomerang back out into the community at a great rate through the guards who are going to be bringing it home to their families. Yeah, you know, some of them may, may take care of vulnerable people. Uh, they have parents. Uh, their, their spouses may work in nursing homes. So, I mean, you know, this idea uh, uh, that, that we can separate ourselves from prisoners, the coronavirus shows how ridiculous that is. We're in, whether we like it or not, we are inexorably connected to each other. Um, and we're already seeing this in rural Ohio. There was an article in the Columbus uh, Dispatch not too long ago about a county in rural Ohio where, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, coronavirus has run rampant in, in the prison. And now many of the guards are ill and many of the, uh, of the broader community, the public health officials are, 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 are counting people in the broader community who are now infected. Um, you know, we, we know how to address this. Public uh, health officials have told us what we need to do. We need to decarcerate the facilities. And governors are the political leaders who have power over prisons as opposed to jails. And governors could release, uh, you know, in every state could release prisoners from the jails today. Uh, they're choosing not to do it. Even the governors who we, we think of as progressive have done almost nothing. I mean, they, they, on a scale of A to F, they, they have been an F. Um, the, right. list, the list of failed governors, let me name them because it's important that we say their names. Gavin Newsom in California has been awful. Andrew Cuomo in New York has been awful. Jared Polis in Colorado has been awful. Phil Murphy in New Jersey has been awful. Gretchen Whitmer in, in, in Michigan has been awful. Kate Brown in Oregon has been awful. Michelle Lujan Grisham in New Mexico has been awful. I mean, there's, there's others. These are, these are people who um, themselves think of themselves as progressive. They say that they believe in science and medicine and public health, but they don't believe in any of those things as soon as prisoners are involved. They give the finger to science and medicine and public health. They're so committed to denying the basic humanity of prisoners, that they're willing to kill prisoners, kill prison guards, decimate rural communities, and fuel a global pandemic in order to show how little they care about prisoners. I mean, so I, I, you know, I can give you examples. Gre Gretchen Whitmer, in, in her, is, there's a complete disaster going on in Michigan prisons. Three of her prisons are among the top 25 clusters in America. Five of her prisons have at least 100 infected people. 2,000 inmates are infected. 300 staff are infected. Dozens of people are dying. And she has released nobody, not one person. Uh, if you care about that, you should, you should hook up with Safe and Just, Just Michigan, who are doing great work on that. You know, the same is true in Ohio. Mike DeWine, who thinks of himself as sort of a progressive Republican who's not Trump. 4,200 incarcerated people in his prison, 450 staff, uh, and he's released fewer than 300 people. Andrew Cuomo in New York, 1,100 staff are positive. They're not even barely testing the prison inmates. There's prisons without soap. A 61-year-old 60, woman has died. He's released fewer than a dozen prisoners. If you care about that, you should re reach out to a group called Release Aging People in Prison, RAP. Gavin Newsom's prisons, he has 24 prisons that are at 120% of capacity or higher. He has released fewer than 3% of uh, people in prison. If you care about that, you should contact the Ella Bakus Baker Center. Governor Ralph Northam in Virginia has four prisons that are among the largest clusters in America, has released only 62 people. Anyway, I, I could go on. They're all awful. Uh, and, and there are groups in your state that are doing something about it. Uh, it's, there's a mass disaster going on. 
And you know, this is so important, David. I really appreciate you naming the people that are um, holding our family members hostage um, and essentially signing their death certificates because that's exactly what they're doing. And just remembering that these are people, right? So part of, you know, Taz has um, always said and like Eddie Ellis has always said that this is also a moment for us to reframe even the way that we talk about it, right? So the, the way that we, you know, talk about illegal aliens or prisoners or inmates, like that's the system's language, right? And so how do we, um, even in the way that we build out the movement that we um, really shape what people are seeing? And Taz and Robert, you know, the work that y'all have done, I think what's so interesting about this moment is that people are, we are in such an uncertain time. And so people are looking for heroes. They are looking for people to believe in. And, you know, I think Taz, myself, and Robert, we're all here in New York. It has been beyond infuriating to see people write articles and GQ pieces and time pieces and trending topics on Twitter about people lauding um, Andrew Cuomo. Um, he is our governor in New York. And he, ha he is actually one of the governors that has used clemency the least before COVID-19, right? Before COVID-19, Governor Cuomo did not care for the safety, the well-being of incarcerated people before that. Even in his conversations around Rikers was more about his war with our, our New York City Mayor de Blasio than it ever was about the people who were inside. And, at the, and the thing that we work on, the health and the people that we are accountable with and build with, people who are drug involved and use drugs, for years, for years, he has refused to remove the criminalization associated with people who use drugs or invest in their health. And so in this moment, when we're seeing people write Jezebel pieces, when we're seeing him, um, people are calling themselves homosexuals, we are confused and infuriated that he is being lauded as someone that we should be following when the example of his leadership has consistently been ab abysmal. That he actually has never really led on the issues that we've needed him to. And that the people that have lived at the margins have only been more at the margins during his tenure. And that that is the point of what we're saying right now, that COVID-19 is not, it's not that people are failing right now, it is that they have always been failing our community. These populations have never been a priority for them, and they have never lifted a finger to do anything to invest in them. And that the decisions that they have consistently made have made this situation even worse. What we're dealing with right now when it comes to homelessness, when it comes to incarcerated people, when it comes to people with vulnerabilities, when it comes to medical access, when it comes to people with disabilities, when it comes to people who are um, navigating the citizenship system, we have made intentional decisions that have made a God-created pandemic even more dangerous. And so, you know, I want to bring in um, Robert, um, who is with um, Vocal New York, um, an urban survivors union, which are drug user unions who have been um, some of DPA's um, most ardent supporters and partners and collaborators and co-conspirators in figuring out how to end the drug war in this conversation around decarceration and figuring out how do we bridge the gap in the conversation around criminal justice, around governors, because the thing is people who use drugs have always known that these actors were bad at decarceration in a health situation. So if we're gonna say drugs is a health crisis, right? If that's what we're going to say, if we're going to say drugs is a health crisis, these governors, these prosecutors, these officers, these mayors have never known how to deal with health crises in the context of drugs in a health crisis. They've never known how to do it. And so Robert, I want to bring you in to talk about the interplay between decarceration and the decriminal and decriminalization as a multi-pronged strategy for us to move forward. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, and one, one, I want to thank everyone for their contribution uh, to this conversation. 
it's been so so on point thus far. Really quickly, when we talk about our governor, um, Cuomo, who says that he is one thing, but plays a role of something else. These bad characters, as as we say, these bad actors. Um, Cuomo has never been an individual who's, who, who's, who's progressive. He claims to be progressive, but he is not. He's rather let individuals die um, and go and continue on as bu with business as usual, rather than rather than do anything that 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 that, that goes towards anything that most of having to do with with progressive with progressive um, progressive rights or or, or or progressive drug policy. In New York, we have been fighting for I cannot tell you how long, for years for simple things, simple things like syringe exchange, simple, simple syringe access. Individuals like Guomo, Governor Cuomo have blocked simple legislation such as that. We're still fighting for legislation that, that goes towards helping individuals move from incarceration to public life when it comes to uh, buprenorphine, right? Or, 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 or opioid substitute, substitute treatments. And we're fighting that hard to get legislation passed, uh, even within the jail, where we know drugs are running rampant. So having, having, having a voice or being able to speak to the governor's staff or to the governor about, about how we move forward with, with decarceration it's something that's just not, it's not happening right now. And the only way we get that done is through the voice of the people. The voice of the people is the only way we're going to move forward with any of that. Legislation with Governor, Governor Cuomo during this, during this pandemic has become, in my opinion, more powerful than him. The rest of the world sees him as, as a leader of the world. Um, and if they only had an understanding of who this man really is, he, he believes in absolutely nothing but where his power lies. And his power does not lie in progressive people. So I am, it, it's hard, it is, it is extremely hard for individuals like me to find ways and means in which to move forward with decarceration, particularly when decarceration simply means setting an individual up for reincarceration when they come out, because when they come out, um, they're looking at parole, right, or probation, right, and that means uh, a setup uh, to be reincarcerated, right, rather than deep, rather than rather than going through what science has proven to, to, to work the the, uh, the 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 the, 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 the just removing the barriers that have to do with people. Uh, who use drugs so rather than rather than having yeah i'm, I'm, I'm a little i'm a little flushed I'm, excuse me i'm sorry guys don't worry about it take your time robert yeah. we're on your time yeah. what we what's, what's what's been needed to be what's, what's been needed to be done is we needed to just end what we call um regulations for drugs we need to we need to just decriminalize drugs and move forward with a true public health approach that keeps people from going to jail to begin with. Rather than thinking about how we decarcerate, let's talk about how we keep people from going to jail in the first place and decriminalize many of the drugs that send people to jail. Marijuana, states have been decriminalizing marijuana back to back to back to back to back. Our closest boy, our closest boy in the country has decriminalized heroin. Heroin. We can where you can now get prescription heroin. The United States and here in New York, we are the largest, we are the largest individuals who contribute to incarceration than any other any other country, than any other state. And I am I, I, I'm just I'm just saddened by how we are we're so far behind. We are considered and the United States to be a very well country in other countries, let alone what people think of us here in New York. New York, that's supposed to be the most progressive state 
there is. We are still going to die. That's not, and, and we know that. We're not. We're not. Yeah. And so, Taz, it's, I think I want to bring in the work that the council is doing around decarceration. But, you know, what Robert is saying is, is really important, and I want to uplift that again, is that as we have the conversations around decarceration, as we should, we have to recognize that some of the people that are most marginalized also continue to face recriminalization because the things that got them inside are still not being addressed in the forefront, right? And there is some work from the prosecutors that are saying we are going to decline to prosecute all these charges and drugs has been showing up in that. But what we know is that the police also haven't gotten the message, right? And so how do we build out um, an actual strategy or demand that actually looks at how do we just remove the arm of criminalization in the first place? But also how are we supporting those inside who are, are not being released right now? And so Taz, I wanna bring you in to talk about what is the vantage point of the National Council? Okay, first let me say um, thank you everyone who's, who spoke before me. I've taken notes and I have stuff kind of all over the place. So what I want to say is one of the things that the National Council was doing before COVID, since we were talking about um, Andrew Cuomo and the governors and all of these different states, we had a Clemency Works uh, campaign which started at the beginning of last year. And what we asked our people in our communities, our uh, members of our the National Council and others was to send postcards to your governors, demanding that your governors start to release people. We have four categories, elderly, um, infirmed, people had, who had been in prison for a long time, and, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the fourth category, but we have four categories. So that was began, that began before COVID hit. So we did the postcard campaign, we demanded that the governors re um, release people. That didn't happen in New York City. Um, Oklahoma, I believe, released some people for the governor released some people, but as I said, it didn't happen in New York City. So what the National Council continues to do, and, and let me just say this and be very clear about this, the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls have been doing this work since 2010 from inside of a prison. We did not just come home today during this COVID and decide that we are going to work to end incarceration women and girls. This is a process that we have been doing. But what we noticed that during this COVID time, it was a time that we thought that people were listening, that the system makers, the prosecutors, the judges, the governors, and those that are in charge of this um, carceral system, we thought that they would be listening a little more. So we started demanding that you start releasing people. Because right now, I consider that prisons are a gas chamber. Because once that virus hits that prison, there's no social distancing in prison. There's no being separated six feet, 10 feet. There are no masks given to people in prison. And even if a person gets sick in a prison, they're gonna isolate that person in a room upstairs by themselves to either die or fight the COVID by themselves. And I know from a person that's been incarcerated for 16 years in a federal system that the way they're doing things is not correct and is not going to help our people. So we have to, we are trying to figure out a way to demand. We send letters to the governors. We're in conversation. Um, our great leader, and Andrea James, is in conversation with senators who are now these uh, who are now having conversations about how do we decarcerate these people? How do we start releasing these, these, these individuals, these incarcerated people, our family? How do we release them? And I'm an action type of person. We've been talking about this for weeks since COVID started. And like I said, the National Council has been talking about this way before COVID started. When do we take action? How do we get people to take action? That is a question that I would like to ask. How do we get people to take action? We can write letters all day, phone calls all day, but we have to demand that take, they take action. And as far, as far as Governor Cuomo in New York, he's not doing anything. And right now is the time that we put pressure on him and we bring awareness to the people that do not know that our incarcerated um, people are suffering because right now he's a celebrity in New York. So how do we reach those people that don't know that he still have incarcerated people dying inside of prison because he's not addressing how this COVID is affecting our incarcerated people. And we have people dying inside. We have people right. dying 
on the street because of homelessness. We have people dying in detention centers. We have people dying dealing with foster care systems. We have people dying in the hospitals and the medical clinics. People are dying all over, right? And what we know is that it is people at the margins that are consistently dying in larger numbers, right? And so it's the homeless population, it's the people that are using drugs, it's the people that are coming out of incarceration. Um, it is the people, it is the same people, right? And, you know, COVID, you know, in the beginning, everyone was like, we're all in this together, we're in, but we're all in the same, you know, we're all in the same boat, but some of us have yachts, some of us has tugboats, some of us have an oar, and I think part of the conversation and the way that we build out the movement, and I want to open this up to everyone, is like, you know, this is an issue around criminalization and around health. Um, and what I'm trying to figure out is like, what are, you know, Rose, you brought this up earlier and Taz and I, and I think David, you also brought this up a little bit in that you know, what are the lessons that we're not learning in this moment that we are recreating, that are impeding us from getting to the point of where Taz is talking about, which is action? Like, what are the le lessons that we haven't learned? And so, for example, I will say one of the lessons that DPA has learned. So 10, 15 years ago, when we were talking about mass incarceration, the 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 narrative that we pushed and a lot of people pushed in the drug policy space was that the drug war was the 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 thing that pushed for mass incarceration and that in order to end mass incarceration we needed to legalize marijuana we needed to release all the non-violent drug low level first time drug offenders that was what we wanted to do right we were like, if we do that, we're going to end mass incarceration. You know, as Peter laid out in the beginning, that's actually not true. Oof, that's actually not true. We, we, we can release everyone currently in a jail and prison for drugs, and mass incarceration will still be intact. So we're going to say that. And it was our, it was our choice around strategy, around how can we expand people's imagination that we made that choice. But we're still dealing, our movements are still dealing with that choice because that's that's where people think is the progressive thing, right? That's what Governor Cuomo may think is the thing. So how is it, in, what are the lessons that we have not learned in this moment? Um, what are the lessons we haven't learned in the last 20 years of us doing this work that are, re that are showing up again that are making it hard for us to actually get to the people that need the most support. Um, so, <laughs> I'm sure we all have something to say on this one, but I would love to jump in first. Um, uh, I really appreciate what Robert said before, which is like decarceration itself can't be the singular goal. Um, we see many national criminal Justice office that count uh, in their ROIs, their return on investment. Uh, just the num their 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 metrics are judged based on the number of fewer people in jails and prisons at the beginning of the grant cycle to the end of the grant cycle, right? And it's this crazy shell game and monetization of people's lives that really leads to. Uh, people putting up blinders about the way all of these multiple systems overlap and interconnect um, and really lead to marginal victories that are vulnerable to being undermined. So Ruthie Gilmore yesterday said, you know, if we're really aligned around the vision of abolition, decarceration is really just one one puzzle piece in the overall puzzle. What we're talking about is the deep investment in the communities and it's in the decriminalization um, that uh, because when folks are criminalized, then it's going to lead to the D, then it's going to lead to incarceration, right? Like, so it's absurd that we have this kind of singular focus on uh, incarceration and incarceration alone. And I will say, as someone who spent a lot of time in the immigrant justice space, uh, it's exclusive, <laughs> like it's an exclusive space. Like we have certain nonprofits who are applauding themselves for, you know, the number of fewer prisons that exist now in certain states. And 
last week alone in California, we saw votes to turn two of these closed prisons into new immigration detention facilities. So it's like if I'm a smoker and I'm trying to quit smoking and I'm saying, hey, I stopped smoking Marlboros, but I now smoke camels and like give me some award like that's not we do not give people awards for just shifting the bodies in these various cages but that's kind of how the large mainstream criminal justice movement has uh, aligned its metrics which is just simply based on uh the pure shifting of bodies and we're missing the bigger picture here so I think when we start capturing that picture, that bigger picture is when we start shifting the framework to thinking more deeply about the investment divestment uh, work that so many of our base building organizations are deeply committed to, which we're not just talking about releasing people, but we're talking about instead of relying on probation to uh work with the re-entering population we are instead investing in community-based alternatives um instead of uh simply say to, saying you know yes we need to um, stop holding people uh, pre-trial. We're also saying, no, we need to invest in the community-based alternatives on the front end that can create the wraparound support for our communities who are in crisis, who do have real needs. But we know that that crisis and that need won't be solved by the carceral state, right? So we need to broaden the framework. And I do think we are seeing some real points of hope in this landscape. I know we're calling out a lot of names and we're, you know, cast and blame where blames do, but the and and but the mutual aid work that has really um, come to light in this post-pandemic era has been so deeply inspiring. And as someone who's spent her career in the nonprofit sector, the reality is that we can't rely on nonprofit profits alone to get us through this, right? Like a lot of this happens in outside of the state tax system, but it happens in just the community-based centers of care. And that I believe uh, needs to be our focus. And as someone who's based out of Oakland, you know, we have a very rich legacy um, that dates back to the Black Panthers, if not earlier, of creating these alternative structures of community-based care. And we're seeing that pop up you know millions of people are getting their food every week through schools alone right we're not relying on the state so i i think um i really appreciate dpa's framing of this conversation about where we're not just focusing on decarceration as much as we see the absolute terrors that are happening in the carceral state right now, but we're broadening it to look at what decriminalization um, and concurrently the investment in communities must look like. Um, as Because again, we've got to be walking and chewing gum at the same time. We've got to be fighting for people's liberation, but we've got to be smart and strategic so that we're not setting people up just to be incarcerated again once this pandemic lifts. Nice, Rose. Um, some of what um, what I was going to say is exactly what Rose said about um, reimagining communities. And one of the one of our campaigns that we we started in 2019, after doing several town halls across the state on the same day at the same time, gathering information from our women that's on the inside of the institution as well as people in different communities across the United States we came up with reimagining our communities. And what we need is to be able to reimagine your communities without the carceral system that we have now. We need to, for us to manage our destiny and the work that we need to get there. So what people are not really learning and thinking about is how do we, how do we have these um, alternatives and how do we have these things that we need in our community without the police without um, the system that's already created for us because we know that that system does not work for us. So like I said, Rose has done a great job of explaining what we need, but how many people actually know what it means to reimagine your community without 
a prison system without something going on in your community where you have to call the police? How many people actually even know their neighbors that live down the block? You know, so in order for us to start changing some of, and decarcerating this system, we have to keep our people out of the system. We have to be able to offer the guys that's on the block that that's hustling, the people that are going through um, mental, mental, um, mental abuse, the women that are on the corner and they feel like the only way they can survive at this time is using their body for financial gain. How do we begin to have something to offer these people so they won't get caught up in this carceral system that criminalizes everything? not just drugs. So we have to begin to think and not be afraid to rebuild our communities and reimagine our communities without the system that's already placed over on this side to destroy us. That's so right. when we, if, every, if we can get, the more people we get on this, the, on that page to, is not, we're not going to fix this system. The system is, is ran exactly how it was created to be, to, to run. That's right. We caught to incarcerate our black and brown people to inc incarcerate anybody that they come up with. Yeah. If yeah. they want to send you to jail, they send you to jail. So we can't fix that system. We can try, we can chip off little pieces. We can get, oh, like you said, they passed a law that, oh, uh, we're not going to uh, sentence nonviolent people. But if you're violent or you have created what they call a violent crime, you're going to go to prison. We can't fix that. So yeah. we have to fix our communities. We have to reimagine our communities without this system. That's right. Once we can do that, and we have to know when, and what uh, you asked, um, what have we not learned? A lot of us have not learned how to go into these systems with participatory budgeting, get that money that in some of these places they want to build. I'm going to use New York for instance. They're talking about closing Rikers. But yet you want to build smaller jails in, in our communities. Why not take that money and build um, a transitional house that are ran by the community and not the people? Why not give that money to someone that can build a school for, 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 for juveniles that are in and out of the juvenile system? Yeah. You know, we have to find ways to, to, to get that money and put it in our communities and let it be community-led, not city-led. And you know, we actually have a ton of experience in the movement around drugs in doing this thing that you're talking about, Taz, which is building alternative structures. You know, the thing about it is like, we have built our movement, and I see folks in the chat from Robert Childs to Christina Rodriguez, um, Robert's here from our drug policy folks here. We have literally built a healthcare system for people who use drugs because they refuse to give healthcare to people who use drugs, right? And the thing that's really interesting about it is that we have built a harm, like a harm, our harm reduction work is really about how do we address the structural inequities for communities that use drugs? And how do we build out the alternatives to do the thing that we need for ourselves? So when you think about the history of syringe exchange in this country, and you think about it in the, in the, in the context of HIV AIDS, we decided our movement decided to give syringes to each other outside of the healthcare system until they could figure out that they wanted to give it to us, right? And so, Robert, you know, your work um, with so many people is this thing about building the alternatives as we're in the movement that is trying to, as we're in the space where people are trying to kill us. And so, oftentimes, when we're having, when the world, when the whole world is going through a pandemic, that pandemic has already started for the people at the margins decades before, right? And so we're thinking about like, what is the pandemic that homeless people have already been dealing with? What is the pandemic that people that use drugs have already been dealing with? And how are those things, and how, how is their experience, what we need to be following and their expertise, what we need to be following as we navigate through? In the same ways that we're having conversation about people who have been incarcerated leading this movement right now, how are we um, positioning people who use drugs, um, who are drug involved, who have never been a part of the system, who their decarceration and humanity has never been deemed essential, right? We're talking about so much about essential services through property and through the trade of goods, but our humanity has never been deemed essential. How do we ask those people how to navigate through a pandemic. And so 
you know, part of it is I want to go to Robert about that, but then Peter, I want to bring you in to talk about what is the data that we need to be tracking right now? Um, because I think so much of the systems are doing the tracking, and I want us to really think about how are we tracking this moment? What is the data that we need to be putting forward in order not to inform them, but to inform us about what we need to be pushing forward? Um, so, Robert, do you want to? Yeah, about why, yeah, just really, really quickly, thank, thank you for bringing up that point. So people who use drugs have been marginalized, demonized, stigmatized. They've just been sort of shut out of so many things uh, over the years. And when you have individuals like these other orgs, these other organizations, who say that they are looking to raise the voices or lift the voices or lift up people who use drugs, and people who use drugs don't see that at all. Um, on the, I'm talking about people on the ground, right? Um, organizations like the Urban Survivors Unions, the, the, the uh, an, uh, an authentic a national drug user union is doing work with helping individuals who are directly impacted by these very issues gain skills so that they can move into the positions that we're in. So we're all about finding ways and means in which to help employ people who are directly impacted who use drugs so that they we, we work ourselves out of a job that's one of the only ways that we're going to have individuals who are impacted by this sort of move away from that that, that criminalization of, of, of drugs the other thing is i love what you say when they talk about siloed organizations right until we start to come together as one huge movement moving towards one cause we will continue to be divided right we'll continue to be divided it's the same thing that applies to when it comes to people on the ground the work that i do is with people who are directly impacted i'm talking about on the ground people who don't know anything about drug policy alliance people who don't know anything about the harm reduction coalition people who don't know anything about any of the work that any of us do unless you are on the ground with your sleeves rolled up getting muddy and dirty talking to these individuals about how they are less than and going to be treated as less than until we are until we educate them to fight for their rights as people who use drugs <clears throat> so that's a lot of the work that's being done on the ground with me and the other survivors right now you're so right when you say and I've got to go back. I've got to go back to this thing with our governors, who have all the power in the world to move change, right? To to end this 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 incarceration. Four hundred and fifty thousand uh, people uh, arrested or, or incarcerated in the United States. One point four million of those individuals um, uh, who, are, who are who are locked up. Um, and, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they are on their way in or on their way out uh, right it's just a, it's just a, it's just, a, it's just a, an endless vicious revolving door that continues to to disinform that continues to to do just to, if it, this 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 mass this thing we call mass incarceration is nothing more than a Jim Crow that continues to just get cheap slavery out of individuals, in my opinion. It just continues to, 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 to bring more harm than good. And we will never end it until once again, like I say, and I, I cannot, I cannot say this enough, until we are engaging individuals who are directly impacted and educating them and raising their voices, not our voices, their voices. Yeah. And so, Peter, it's important for um, us to continue to bring this conversation around data because I think at times the academy and data can be super numbing, right? So people get super overwhelmed about these things. I think PPI does a great job in um, doing data visualization and making stuff tan um, accessible. But I think when we're talking about people who are consistently living, that are marginalized and living at the marginalized and being criminalized at the margins, um, data can be used against us. And we've seen this in the ways that um, people use risk assessments. We've seen this 
and the ways that people are pushing forward conversations around criminal, you know, criminal justice reforms and are using data as a way to navigate that. I'm interested in the role that data is playing in the decision or not the decision um, or getting people to not decide to release people or to decriminalize um, kinds of conversations. So what is what is the data that we need to be looking for right now um, as we push forward? What are the things that we need to be tracking? And then also recognizing, you know, DPA, we are very big on civil liberties and figuring out the role, the criminalized, the ways that surveillance and tracking and data can be used against our people. And we see that in the way that we build out tools. Um, so really interested in your thoughts about how, how we navigate data in this, in this movement movement around decarceration and decriminalization. That's a big question, and I'm not sure how helpful I'm going to be here because there's a bunch of ways in which we don't have a criminal justice system. And so, like, I, let me explain what I mean. But I think you're right to worry about what is the bias of the system and does the system collect data that advances its interests versus the interests of the people who are on the receiving end of the criminal justice system? That's a good question and would be entirely true except I think it's a little bit worse than that. So rather than, because we don't have one coordinated criminal justice system. We have a federal system. We have 50 states plus DC, American Samoa, Puerto Rico. So that's one plus 52, 53. We have 3000 counties that are basically all doing their own thing with a little guidance from the state and state law, but not really. And then we have 25,000 municipalities that are also largely doing their own thing and they do not talk to each other. And so some of the things when you see, you know, the Bureau of Justice has released a report, they kind of fix some of the incompatibilities and they really don't, or the whole pie gives you this nice, clean, comprehensive, big picture view. But let's be really clear that the methodology in that report is five or 6,000 words long. And we talk really openly about how large chunks of that data in that report is from 2002 and about how a lot of the obvious things that you wish were in the in that report aren't there, not because we forgot, but because the data doesn't exist and we've not figured out a way to change the question to something parallel to that original obvious question that we actually can answer. And so a lot of what we do at the Prison Policy Initiative is find ways to change the question to something that can be answered and still meets that original need. So my question then is, for what data do we need? I think it's a lot about asking ourselves, what do we really need? Not what do we want, but what do we need? And how hard is it gonna to be to collect that data and will it tell the story we want? Like just thinking of something we were doing today, a large number of prisons and jails are starting to post data about how many people are infected by their staff or incarcerated people. And but then they go and they take down yesterday's data. And they're also being very different in terms of whether or not they're testing people. And are they doing what Ohio is doing and testing everybody? Or are they doing what other places are doing and testing them just if they show lots of symptoms? Um, our staff reported those differences are huge. And it really changes what we can do with that data. And it's pretty easy to say, oh, I want to collect all this stuff. And I think honestly, as a data person, what we have to do is ask ourselves, do we need that? How much time is it gonna take? Who are we gonna show it to? Are people gonna be persuaded by that? Because there's plenty of things, there's plenty of people who don't care about data and they don't need a chart and they don't need numbers to show you that um, how exponential spread works in a confined space. Um, but there are also people who need to see that. And there's different strategies that we all can make. So there's not a one size fits all solution. Um, but we got to really think about who our individual audiences are and what we think their sticking points are and whether or not we can come up with data or an argument that they need. So this is a little bit of a non-answer, but, um, no, but it's, it's a right. problem. Yeah. You know, I think this point that you're making about like, not just the data that we want, but the data that we need. Um, uh, I follow 
the work of the people on these calls and some more closely than others because some of you tweet more than others. And someone who does tweet a lot is David. And <laughs> um, it was great to watch the chat come alive on this Zoom as everyone's like, go David, go name them. Name the governor of Virginia was one that came up in the chat. Um, and one of the things that I think that is so important is I think, you know, I was on a call right before this talk with um, an ad agency that was asking me like how, you know, cause I had spoken to them and I told them that how complicit they have been in the work um, that we fight against. And, you know, David, this conversation around the media and its role in how it shapes people's ability to be aspirational about what this moment represents um, in the way that they write their stories in the ways in the ways that they figure out what stories to elevate we saw this play out in a it was a master class in the complicitness of the media um in new york around bail reform um where they just went out of their way <laughs> to shrink the imagination of new yorkers around what justice could look like and what actually safety was and so it is you know, we can talk about the media that we want for decarceration and decriminalization, but I want you to speak specifically to what is the media that we need um, in order to give us the opportunity and the space for us to do the reimagining the National Council is asking for. Because I think we need multiple prongs to create the space for the imagination. I mean, some people are doing it worse than others. You know, you know, one of my uh, theories really is that, uh, you know, more than any other group of people, it's objective journalists, objective in quotes, um, and, and the sort of uh, uh, tropes that are common in objective journalism that, that cause mass incarceration every bit as much as the politicians or the public. I mean, the, the way that they uh, frame stories frequently is um, is awful, and and you know with bail reform, one of the things that we saw in New York is the way that they sort of cherry pick uh, these very unusual situations where people get out of prison and commit uh, additional crimes, and and completely erase all the people who get out and and do wonderful things, you know, get jobs and graduate from high school and. Uh, uh, you know, go to church and take care of their kids and, and, and go dancing. You know, all of that gets erased. But as soon as there's a, a, a single case of somebody getting out of prison uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, committing a violent crime, it's the end of the world. Um, and, you know, and, and the truth is, is that, you know, we could just, you know, take every single person who's ever violated the law and lock them up forever. I mean, that, that is sort of the idea underneath what the media is saying to us. Um, you know, all the pot smokers and, and all the drug users and all the violent people and everybody, we could just lock them up, you know, all, all the speeders, all the jaywalkers. Um, you know, but as soon as as soon as somebody's arrested, they, they act like and somebody gets out and does something awful, then that story becomes sort of Willie Horton. In other words, the media uh, uh, actively engages in a sort of racist demonization. Uh, they're not they're not reporters of that. They're participants in it. You, you know, you see it in stark contrast. I was a, a friend of mine uh, here in Oregon was doing some research about Mississippi and Alabama and how they used to send people home. People in the prisons would just get s sent home by the governor every Christmas for a week and would be expected to come back. And in, in a couple of instances, the, pers the, the people didn't come back. And the Alabama newspaper said, well, you know, what's the big deal? If we had been sent home, maybe we wouldn't have come back either. You know, I mean, in other words, the, the, the idea that, that, that the, the things are reported the way they are and that that's sort of inevitable, is just false. I mean, the media has chosen the Willie Horton narrative uh, uh, to elevate. Uh, it's, it's certainly not the only way of, of looking at things. Um, you know, but, but uh, you know, to me, the media, the reason why we need the media to be better, it all, and, and the reason all, all of what we're saying, whether it's the data or the media, or the, uh, the, the individual stories of people, it, to me, it all comes back to one thing, is that we need to vote the motherfuckers out. I mean, th this idea that 
you know, sort of there's a good party and a bad party on these issues or that there's some people because of maybe their skin color or whatever, they get it. The truth is just the opposite. I mean, there's very few elected politicians in America who are not actively pro mass incarceration. And we've seen at the district attorney level that we do have the ability to elect people who, while not perfect, are very, very, very different from the people who existed previously. Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, uh, he's not perfect, but he's been really pushing the decarceration. This is a guy who sued the Philadelphia Police Department 75 times before becoming district attorney. Um, or, or Chesa uh, 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 Boudin out in, in San Francisco, whose father has been incarcerated since he was one year old and is still incarcerated. He's 75 years old and may well die in a New York prison. Uh, and Chase, uh, you know, just yesterday, uh, they, uh, he was, uh, you know, encouraged and was part of a sort of coalition of people in San Francisco who voted to close a, a jail. Uh, so there are people who are different, but uh, so far we've only shown an ability to elect them at the district attorney level. We need to start voting out mayors, city council people, attorneys general, governors. There are, in those positions, we've shown no political power. And, and until we do, they're just going to run the system in ways that fuck people over. Um, I mean, I don't know what else to say. Until we punish them by voting them out of office, they're just going to keep fucking us over. We're just talking to ourselves. Uh, so that, that, it just comes down to that. Um, you know, it, it, we're not going to engage in moral suasion. Uh, uh, with them. We have to vote the motherfuckers out. That's right. That's right. And, and I think it's... Oh, go ahead, Taz. And vote our people in. Yeah. We have people that... Are, we have powerful people that are part of this movement. And I don't mean the, the lights, camera, action people that just want to be on CNN. And the, I mean, we have powerful people that are in this movement that do the hyper-local grassroots work every single day that need to be running. And right now we have 189 viewers that's watching this. And I'm sure that out of some of those, 80 of those people, if not more, can be running for, for political seats all across the board. So we have the people that can do it. And we have to start encouraging our people to run for these positions and take these seats. Whether we see the seat as a small seat in just the commission of something in your area, a council person, or the mayor or the governor, we cannot be afraid to take these seats. That's and right. These seats. And you know, I think it's, I think one of the things that is so important about this is that we can't actually build the alternative if we don't have the people in place to keep those alternatives in place, right? And so how useful is it um, for us to spend so much time thinking and dreaming and reimagining our communities if the people that we are voting to be in charge are scared of the things that we want. So we need the dreamers. Um, we need the visionaries to also be the municipal leaders, right? And we also need to figure out if the structures that we have right now to do municipal governance is even the structure that we want. If we are willing to take down the structures that are incarcerating our people, then why are we willing to interrogate the structures that govern us, right? And so it's really about expanding the conversation. And I think it's also about recognizing that we have to um, build as we walk and recognize that we can't let um, the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I want to be very clear that when I say the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good does not mean that we can throw others away because they don't fit in the grant proposal that we wrote. Okay, that, that, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that we're not, we are, we need to be in active movement towards the dream. That dreaming is a verb. It is not a stagnant vision and that the more that we learn, the more that we work together, the more data that we show, the more media that we push, the more conversations that we put forward, the more we're listening to the people that were living in a pandemic before there was COVID-19. The more we are listening to the people that have already struggled with homelessness, the people that have already struggled with not being able to be employed, the people that have already struggled with having access to health care. These people have been living in a pandemic. It may be worse, the gravity may have raised, but it was never in a situation where they were okay. 
right? And that's when it's, it's calling the question, how much do we believe that humanity is essential? Right? How much, what is the question around essentialness? Who is essential? Is the thing that our movement needs to expand the view? Because at some point, there are some people that only work for the humanity of people that commit harm. There are some people that work for people that are drug involved. Some people that work for people that are not citizens. Some people that work for people that are doing sex work. And it's not that all those populations are not essential. It means that we actually have to push forward because if we, one of the things that we have learned from being students of the immigrant defense project was that when the drug war stuff got better, the immigration stuff got worse, right? Or the conversation in being students of Lynn Paltrow at the National Advocates for Pregnant Women or Erin um, Mary Cloud and Lisa Sangoy from Movement for Family Power, where they say the conversation for criminal justice has gotten better, but foster care has gotten worse, right? And so it, it pulls out the limits of our movement because we're not dreaming together. And so one of the things that is super important, why we wanted to have a conversation of decarceration, why we wanted to put forward is that because our work is focused and working with people who are already living at the margins through their involvement with drugs, we recognize, because we ran the progressive prosecutor races 20 years ago. We pushed for the ending of mandatory minimums 20 years ago. We've worked to do the, um, you know, to regulate drugs to see if ending prohibition in some way is helpful, right? We, th the drug policy space has done these things. And the thing that we're at right now, for example, in Oregon, working with people on the ground there is Initiative 44, where we are not only working to decriminalize drugs, but to actually build up a healthcare infrastructure for the people we say we, we support. How do we build out the infrastructure for healthcare for people who use drugs? Because we know currently the healthcare system that we have is not going to do that. So if we want to decriminalize drugs, we also have to work on giving people healthcare. That we can't just remove one thing that's on people's necks and leave another one in place. And so when we talk about decarceration from a place of working in, within a population that is super marginalized, through the lessons that we have learned with working for people who use drugs um, and people who are drug involved, understanding that we cannot, the thing that Robert said, and I want to elevate again, is that we cannot work on decarceration. Decarceration is useless. If when our people come back outside, they are recriminalized for what they went in for, and then they go back. And so we cannot actually, we do not have the luxury of using one strategy. We have to use decarceration, we have to use decriminalization, we have to bring out what COVID-19 is exploiting is all the fault lines. And so our strategy has to be um, recognizing all the fault lines, right? And so how do we build an aspiration that is to the scale of the issue? I think what COVID-19 lays, lays bare for us is the scale of the issue. And that abolition is a goal, but that the work we can be doing right now, going back to Ruthie Gilmore, is that we all need to be working on abolishing the conditions that created the situations that we're all in. And so even if you're not trying to get to abolition, your strategy should be abolitionist in nature because you need to eradicate and eviscerate the conditions that have put us in this situation right now, right? And so that is the conversation that we want to elevate and excavate in this moment. And so I want to thank our speakers. And I'm seeing that we have 33 minutes left. And I did promise 183 people that we would be having questions. So I'm going to put myself on mute because my colleague, Queen Adesui, is going to be staffing the question and answer portion. And I'm going to hope that um, she is ready now, so I can put myself <laughs> on mute and drink some water. <laughs> I am ready. Thank you all for an amazing conversation.
Um, want to start us off with this first question, which I think is largely targeted to Taz and Robert. Can you all share and uplift programs, initiatives, whether formal or informal, that are actually working well to support folks and communities following release, particularly in current context of lockdown and social distancing guidelines? And just to caveat that question um, with another question that came in similar, are there any alternative and community structures that manage and support people and families to provide rehabilitation for people with histories of physical violent behavior? Okay, I can't think of any right off the top of my head. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer this to Taz. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, and uh, could you repeat that second question? Are there any alternative and or community structures that manage and support people and families to provide rehab for people with histories of physical violent behavior? Rehab and supports. Okay, we have one of our sister, sister Anissa Thomas that works with um, domestic, domestic violence survivors. So basically what we do at the National Council when someone comes to us that, is, that are being released, we connect them to one of our, um, our sister organizations that are doing that work in that specific area. So if, if I had someone that was getting released right now from New York or needed some, something that falls under um, domestic violence, I would recommend them to um, my sister Nissa, and then she would therefore take that up. In um, Boston, we have a sister, um, Stacy Borden, who just got a, a house that um, we're waiting to open that will have sisters released. And Stacy is a clinician that um, she has a case act and she, she works with people that um, have mental trauma and um, drug abuse trauma and as well as other things. So we have the connection at the National Council. We are the umbrella that connects all the other networks and people around the world that need, you know, different things. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Rose, can you please share any info on children and families in detention? We are not hearing much on this and would like to get more connected to the advocacy on that front. Yeah, so sadly, we have seen very little movement, um, sadly and yet not surprisingly, um, we've seen very little movement to release uh, children and families being held in immigration detention. Um, by little movement, I mean like nothing. Um, what we have seen, I put out certain protocols for who they would consider to uh, release. Uh, those protocols, um, I should say, exclude anyone who has any drug conviction, um, even something like being under the influence is excluded from those release protocols. Uh, they, uh, so we have, we've seen very, very little movement. Um, this despite the fact that we have submitted letter upon letter signed by uh, over 3,000 medical professionals decrying the public health crisis that exists in the detention centers. This despite the fact that immigration detention is really a, a recent phenomenon, that it doesn't have to exist at all. Uh, we have seen a 45% increase in the number of immigration detention centers just since 2017. Um, back in 2003, uh, 20,000 people total were held in these centers, whereas now it's you know five times that. So, this we have seen very little movement um and yes children and families and elderly and those with convictions are all still being held um and uh, very few being released so what we are seeing unfortunately as most as being very effective are lawsuits and right now there are 30 different lawsuits that have been filed across the country where we have federal judges ordering specific centers to release people uh, even even the guards themselves to david point uh have filed lawsuits um based on the exact same conditions that we in the immigrant advocacy community are alleging saying hey there are there's no soap in these facilities uh it is impossible to have the social distancing which is uh, recommended which is in a facility it's supposed to be to get the six feet apart it's supposed to be 28 feet in most facilities, it's a maximum of three square feet that people have. Um, 
So it's absolutely impossible to get the social distancing recommended. So lawsuits are um, providing one lever uh, of release and we have uh, under, in here in California, there's a San Diego lawsuit where 70 people are supposed to be released by tomorrow. Um, so far, we haven't yet met those numbers, but uh, there, we're, we're seeing very little movement. Um, and again, that's another reason why those of us who are in the advocacy space making demands um, on sheriffs, on DAs, on governors to release people really have to be connecting with folks from the immigrant advocacy space to make sure those demands are inclusive of the needs of immigrants, making sure that we are at the same time saying no more ICE collaboration, saying that we absolutely oppose any individual who is being released from um, a state jail or prison being transferred to uh, ICE custody. Thank you for that. Uh, did anyone else have anything to say? No. When we see district attorneys and state attorneys saying that certain offenses, so drug offenses, sex work, property crimes, um, are not threats to society during this pandemic, how do we ensure that we are able to make sure that they do not go back to enforcing those very crimes since they acknowledge during this time that it's, the enforcement is BS? <laughs> This is I asked that again. question. Who asked that question? Um, I want to talk to you. Um, it's so it's so critical that we're not just thinking of our response now as an emergency response, as a reactive response, but we're laying the foundation to. Um, to build on these gains and to enshrine them as new practices going forward. I think a critical component of that um, is that we're not just forward looking, but we're backward looking as well. So we're looking at not just releasing people, but we're looking at setting in place very clear uh, pre-charge or pre-plea diversion programs. Um, I have worked with many advocates who are involved in specific DA advocacy across the country. And one of the things that we're really conscious about doing is that we're not solely calling for release, but we're calling to a, a foundational change in front end charging practices where either they, the DAs commit to declining these charges at all going forward um, or cr creating separate community-based alternatives to the carceral charging system. So that's one piece is that we're focused not just on back back end releases, but we're focusing on closing that front end pipeline. The other piece that I think is really important and that we haven't talked about as much today in, to, in the call is what reparations really looks like um, and how DAs can mm -hmm. be involved in repairing the harm. And some of that is really through the record clearance practices that they put into place um, and make making sure that those record clearance practices are specifically um, targeted at repairing the, the harm caused to that individual. So we have seen a trend from some prosecutors to engage in automatic record clearance for people who have, for example, certain marijuana offenses. What we have not seen as much, despite our adamant pleas, is that uh, these that the record clearance be inclusive of the needs of non-citizens. So uh, by adding a few simple words, that record clearance will actually erase the conviction for, from someone's immigration record as well, although a simple expungement will not. Um, however, very few uh, advocates and very few DAs are actually including those few simple words. And thereby, we still have the the yoke of this conviction hanging over the, the necks of uh, immigrants. So again, I think we need to broaden our focus to not just demands for release, but demands to changing and charging practices going forward and demands to uh, DAs to take proactive measures to uh, clear the records of uh, people who already have been charged so that they can't later get picked up on those warrants, so they can't later be used for a sentence enhancement, so that they can't be a barrier to employment, so they, they can't form the basis for deportation. Thank you. Yeah. Could I answer that too? For sure, it is open for everyone. 
Yeah, I just I just wanted to highlight that question because I think it's it's one of the most important um, that we're facing in this particular moment is, you know, setting aside what I was talking about previously with regard to prisons, uh, where we've made almost no progress. Right now, there are a lot fewer people in our jails than there were, uh, 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 you know, 90 days ago. And in some places, dramatically fewer, like 30, 40, 50 percent. And so the question is, how do we make sure that that doesn't uh, 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 go back to nor you know, go back to what it was when this is over? And I, I think there will be tremendous pressure for it to go back, which is to say, the police will be, uh, um, you know, enforcing broken windows and drug war offenses, like they have been for the last 30 years. And, and to some degree, they're the one, because they are at the very front end of the system, they're the ones that determine how much flows into it. And prosecutors can do, can, can do stuff with that flow. Um, but it, it, it's a, a, a tremendously time-consuming task to sort through all of those cases, uh, divert most of them, and, uh, accept a few of them. And, and uh, um, you know, a lot of harm is done even prior to the prosecutors getting involved. And so I, I think what we need to do is, uh, you know, make it clear to the people who run police departments, which is to say largely mayors uh, in most American cities, that, that we need fewer police. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is, is that there's far too much garbage that is coming into the system that prosecutors then have to sort through and that they spend colossal amounts of money sorting through. What we need is much less garbage coming into the system in the form of these very low level offenses where arrest is not necessary. Uh, and so there's going to be a huge budget crisis in every city. And I think it's up to us to say to the elected officials, the, the mayors who run police departments and the city councils that fund them, is to say, you know, for too long, you've been selling us a very narrow understanding of what public safety looks like. And that is making colossal numbers of arrests for low level things. Meanwhile, at the same time, we don't have enough fucking doctor's masks for doctors and nurses and, and you know, you have been telling us that this is what public safety looks like. Public safety is, is tons of broken window and drug war offenses. And actually, that's wrong. You've been selling us a false bill of goods. And now that there's this money crisis, we demand that you stop misspending all of this money on endless numbers of police officers and that you reallocate it to things that are much more pressing right now, namely all the people who are out of work all the lack of medical supplies, all the contract tracers that we need in order to safely live. Um, so I think it's, it's the critical question uh, going forward is how do we maintain these gains? And I think the answer is to radically defund police departments. Thank you, does anyone else wanna weigh in? And I'd be remiss not to add on to Rose's points around collateral consequences, just to ensure that you know reform also includes ending drug testing for benefits or for anything at all. We know drug testing creates huge barriers for people, especially people who use drugs, unnecessarily to access resources that they need uh, to keep you know life stable. So we're gonna go on to the next question. Um, how do you all? Um, navigate the limits of individual nonprofits and nonprofit industrial complex when we're thinking about decarceration. This is open to anyone who'd like to answer. Taz, you're on mute. I see you talking. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, re repeat the question. I wanna make sure that I, I answer correctly. How do you all navigate the limits of either your individual nonprofits or nonprofits generally and the nonprofit industrial complex when we're talking about decarceration? So the limits we have when we do advocacy through nonprofits. Um, we, we at the National Council are the nonprofit organization. And because we are ran and our entire staff are formerly incarcerated, we just continue to do this work because we know the people that we left behind. And our fearless leader goes out 
and 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 she deals with the bring trying to get the funding coming in trying to get the money coming in and we um we just follow her lead but like i said we're all formerly incarcerated so right now i believe that most of my coworkers, if we weren't getting paid for this work we would be doing it because we left so many people behind that have crazy sentences that some people when we went in prison was was there already and we left them in prison so this fight for us is not always about money and what my paycheck is going to look like it's about abolishing this prison system because we know that it's unjust thank you did anyone else want to weigh on on the limitations of a nonprofit industrial complex we're talking about decarceration and even abolition. Abolition has come up um, in this conversation. Reparations has come up. What are the limitations to nonprofits? So I, I'm not a panelist, but I'll jump in here and say that <laughs> I think it's important for people to recognize that nonprofits are structured around a tax structure. And that I think it's important for people to recognize that we need to be doing organizing outside of what we get paid for. And then we're actually not really going to build power if we think it's going to be a nine to five job. And that's not to discredit anything that Taz says. That's talking about me personally as someone who is an employee of Drug Policy Alliance. Drug nonprofit and nonprofits, because they are part of the nonprofit industrial complex, they're not political homes. Um, we need to be building political infrastructure for us to do the political education and the organizing. You know, Rose, the thing that you were saying at the beginning of the call around mutual aid, that comes through politicization. And so I think it's really a politicization and really going back to the strategies that we know and how we build community. And so I think it's really important when we have conversations around decarceration. I work at an organization that is not an abolitionist organization. I'm about to be in charge of an organization that is not going to be an abolitionist organization, but we will be using abolition tactics to to abolish the conditions that make the drug war possible. And so I think it's really about figuring out how do we actually push forward? Because, you know, we had a talk last, I mean, this week, oh no, maybe it was last week that we put together with one of our scholars where he said, you know, sure, we can let go of everyone who's there on a drug charge, but if we actually care about decarceration, we're gonna have to work with a whole bunch of other movements to actually end incarceration. And that may be during my nine to five, or it may not be during my nine to five. And so I think we have to recognize what nonprofits are and what they are not. And that question and that answer is going to be personal for every single person. But I think it is unfair um, and not right to think that a nonprofit can do all the things that we needed to do. Because nonprofits are jobs and they're built on a, a, a tax structure. And what we need is so much more than our job. What we need is so much, like our humanity is not measured through the job that we have, it, or it shouldn't be. And so I think we have to be asking more of ourselves and more of our movement to really understand when we say who is down, it's like who, who does organizing outside of the work that they do. Um, and I think that is super important. And I think that's what we learn because as Taz said, the work of the National Council was not happening, was happening inside when they weren't getting paid, when they, when they realized that they needed the political structure and the political power to push forward. And then they came outside and then they made it, you know, made it an organization that has all this tax structure and they have all this infrastructure, but the work is still happening inside with the people that are not getting paid, that are not in a nonprofit, right? And so it's really about this moment, make the decision. We are, we, when everybody wants to know what they would have done in the civil rights movement, what they would have done in the Women's Live movement, when they, that moment is now. If you can find yourself only picking up a paycheck and not doing outside organizing or politicization or act, that, then, then that actual work, then we can have an, an, another conversation. Um, but it can't all be on nonprofits because we have to make the condition that we are going to do this work with or without payment. And some people do it without payment and they should be paid and some people that are getting paid to do the work and creating harm. And so we can have that conversation as well. But right now we have to recognize what are the limits of nonprofits and understand that decrim the decarceration, decriminalization, dignifying our humanity is not going to only happen through a nonprofit and that should not be our, our main method to getting our people free. Thank you. 
So I wanted to um, bring us back to a question that came up around drug decrim, since folks mentioned that, I think specifically Robert, that we need to decriminalize all drugs. The question was, do we think that decriminalizing drugs is enough? Or I think they, they were hinting towards a legalization or regulatory model. Should we be regulating all drugs? Robert, you're on mute. It must look funny when you're talking, you can't hear anything. <laughs> so uh, decrim the decriminalization along with regulation of drugs is something that <clears throat> a lot of orgs have been looking and pushing for all around the country. Um, I mean, so many other, so many other countries have done it. I mean, these are, these are, these are, these are proven, these are scientifically proven facts that work, right? When you, when you, when you decriminalize, or when you regulate uh, certain things, it, it goes towards ending prohibition, right? Essentially ending the drug war, right? And you have to wonder why I, why we haven't done it yet. One of the things that I often talk about is we've gone through now uh, more than four decades, right, into our eighth president, and we have spent more than $1.5 trillion on the longest running war, if you will, in U.S. history. Right? And the question I always think, the question that comes up is, after all that, what's it not going to take to end it? Which is a big, which is a big, a big move. So um, when you think about, when you think about decriminalizing and regulating drugs, you also have to think about the possible, the possibility of taking food off of somebody else's plate, right? Thank you, Robert. Anyone else wanted to weigh in on that? Queen, you're helping obviously to run uh, the decriminalization work at the federal level, but I would just say that much from the, from the immigrant rights perspective, much of immigration law is controlled at the federal level. And so even though we might change the um, state practices around criminalization, because it's still criminalized at the federal level, uh, immigrants are often left out of the benefits of the local state decriminalization. And that is shown in the data, the second highest uh, rate of ICE arrests uh, in 2019 were based on drug-related offenses, uh, you know, even an inf a state infraction related to drugs is classified at the federal level as an aggravated felony that could lead to mandatory deportation for even a longtime green card holder. So the reality is that unless we, to, to David's point as well, unless we're looking at what's happening in the federal uh, system, while at the same time moving on our state campaigns, we're going to get victories that are marginal and vulnerable to being undermined and uh, kind of by definition leave people out. Thanks, and we have 10 minutes left. I'm gonna pass it back to Cassandra, but quickly I did wanna add on that last question, um, just the benefits that we'll have if we're able to actually offer people a safe supply, which decrim does not include. Um, and yeah, there's plenty of benefits when it comes to actually being able to regulate, but we're gonna pass that off to Cassandra now. All right, so folks, we are coming to the end of our two hour discussion. Um, I want to thank very deeply the people that were first up in the DPA teleconference discussion series, David, Rose, Peter, um, Robert, a special, special thank you to Taz, um, who um, sat in for us for Andrea James, who could not join. And Andrea told me she could not join and that she was going to put Taz in. And then I was like, okay, cool. And then like three minutes before, Andrea was like, Taz didn't get an email, but Taz somehow showed up on the screen, already had the Zoom and was ready to go and brought us so much. Um, so Taz, special thank you to you who did no prep but came here and still blew it up. Much appreciation. Mm -hmm. I want to remind folks that we will be continuing this discussion series, looking and really elevating some of the conversations that came here around reentry, around health and harm reduction, treatment. Um, we'll really be talking about economic justice in our informal and gig economies. 
Um, and you know, Robert, your point around regulation, taking the um, the food off some people's plates once we move to regulation. We saw this with marijuana legalization as well. Then moving to the point that um, Queen brought up around safe supply and drug regulation, and then ending with drug war policing and surveillance. Um, and so everyone that is on the call, you will get information about those follow-up conversations. We're really challenging folks who joined this conversation around decarceration because this is your body of work to continue to come to the conversations outside of your space. So really coming into the health and treatment conversations, those that are working on health, recognizing that economics is a driver of health as well and joining our conversations around informal and gig economies as well as um, uh, safe supply and the product, the structure of regulation. And everyone should be on a conversation around policing and surveillance. Um, COVID-19 is elevating a new level of surveillance. Obviously, the scale of the public health crisis is a reason um, why these interventions are being put forward. However, we again know, based on being people that live on the margins, how these inventions, public health interventions, will be used on people that live at the margins, people that um, are of color, that are poor, that don't have access to resources, how we are going to use surveillance as a way to criminalize, punish, or judge, or stigmatize groups of people. And so we really want folks to um, continue to join the discussion series. Um, our colleagues at Drug Policy Alliance um, are really putting together a great program that's um, really excavating the different intersections that we're all working and living at. Um, and I want to be really clear, you know, this was a great conversation. I really, really thank those, um, our panelists. You know, it's really interesting on our prep call, everyone was like, I don't think I know that much about drugs to have a conversation, but we filled two hours um, and we had good conversation. And just reminding folks that, you know, the work that we are doing right now in this rapid response moment in this pandemic is the work that we've always done. It is the work that Rose has done. It's the work that David's done. It's the work that Peter's done. It's the work that Robert has done. It is the work that Taz has done. It is the work that DPA has done. And so we will continue to do the things that we said we want to do. We will decarcerate, we will decriminalize, and most importantly, we will dignify the lives of our community members because humanity is essential. And that is the service that all our work is meant to do. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We'll, you'll follow, you'll get an email from us with inf information about our next teleconferences. Thank you so much. The recording will be available. This is all recorded. We will send it over to folks. No, it will not include your Zoom chats. Um, so uh, thank you so much, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.